Class is in session here again in Lecture Hall Room 101 of the Stately Apartment Academy, your institution of higher NOI. I'm your host, the Dean of the Apartment Academy, Daniel Cunningham, and this podcast is the multifamily industry's only operations-focused podcast, which features insights from industry leaders, investors, vendors, and technology providers. So if you invest in multifamily real estate or you're involved in day-to-day on-site operations of apartment buildings, we are your source for efficient operations and maximizing ROI. Class is in session. So today's professor, our guest lecturer, is Michelle Bechner-Cowan, who is the Managing Director of National Client Services for Graystar. And Michelle is going to share with you some very interesting uh, perspectives from really the leader in multifamily operations and what they think about in terms of what's important to them providing quality um, operations, a quality experience for residents. And I know you're going to have some things to take away. So here we go. Enjoy. Well, hi, Michelle. Welcome to the Apartment Academy. Um, look, you've been in, in the multifamily world about 14 years, a little over half that time with Graystar. Um, can you just start us off by talking about your path to this role and, and what, what does it mean to be a managing director of, of national client services? Thank you, Daniel. And uh, yes, I've been in the industry. Um, I would say this is my second bout. So you may not realize I started in the industry actually back in 1984 as a leasing consultant, worked on site for a number of years, and um, then left the industry in the early 90s, mid 90s, uh, to go back and get my degree in uh, microbiology. And I have two masters, one in curriculum instruction, the other in natural science. And so I taught public high school for seven years. And so I came back in the industry in 2005. So this is my second stint. And since then, yes, um, I've been with Graystar for the last eight years overseeing the client services group. And what does that, what does that mean to provide client services? Um, that's a great question. So in, in my department, we are interfacing both with existing clients and new clients and almost in two tracks. The first one is um, trying to go out and um, you know obtain um, new business um, with our existing clients and new clients. So any assets that are either stabilized and there's a transaction where a cro- property is going through a disposition or maybe a management change. And then also pre-development for new ground, you know, new construction ground up. And then the second aspect of client services is our account management or our relationship lead program, where we have additional resources that were assigned to our clients that have large portfolios and they have geographic dispersion. And what we're trying to do is really drive consistency within those portfolios and help support the client. Um, with one point of contact, and then also assist the operations to drive that consistency in in the operational aspect of that that client's portfolio. So, Michelle, you know, Graystar um, is not only the largest operator in the country by far, but but at the same time, very well respected. Um, so, what is it that what is what would you say sets Graystar apart? I, I, I know you probably want to say people, but I would say. Uh, I'll let you talk about people, but apart from people, um, uh, what what is it that that you think Graystar does that really sets it apart from from other operators? That's a great question, and you are correct. The people um, we are in a people business, but I would say other than that is <laughs> the the aspect of you know because of our depth, we're able to offer a lot of resources that maybe other smaller companies cannot provide. So when you look at the different aspects that we manage, right? We manage active adult. So we have an active adult, an active adult division. We have student, so we have a student division. We have our third party and then we also have our owned assets, right? So we've got all of these different funnels or tracks of assets that we're managing that we really can provide some wonderful data and introspection and retrospection to our clients. And then, of course, we also have the, you know, construction management division. And then when you look at all the different support departments that we have across, you know, the the scope of our business, 
we really have the ability to take, I would say, sometimes complex problems and really try to break them down and create solutions, not only for the operations team, but also for the client. Yeah, uh, I think that's not a surprise. I mean, the size and scale of of Graystar I mean, certainly must allow for 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 capabilities that smaller operators just just frankly can't duplicate. Um, and you know, look as you know, I have another persona where I spend most of my day, which is which is the CEO of Leonardo twenty four seven, which which has been a software partner of Graystar's for a while. But um, during that time. You know, I've had the privilege to really get a kind of a peek under the operations uh, hood of Graystar. One of the things that um, is really impressive it, to see in action is the thought that goes into the operating platform. You know, the amount of of resources dedicated to establishing best practices, selecting technologies to deploy, developing training. Um, uh, what would you say... Um, of of all of those things, and, and again, um, resources that a lot of other management companies may not have, right? To, to to spend that kind of time, but if of all of those times, of all those areas where you spend time, where Graystar spends time thinking about operations, if you could just focus on one of them, what what delivers? If you were a smaller operator, and could only had limited resources, what has made the biggest difference? Do you think in terms of thinking about the operating platform? What's made the biggest difference in in operations in the field? You know, that's a great question. And I think that, you know, because our world today is so focused on technology, I'm probably going to focus on the response is really being, you know, technology focused. So when you're looking at the resources that we deploy for the, you know, the property management system, and understanding all the different nuances that can bolt onto it to create really operational efficiencies for the on-site team. So whether it's, you know, a technology for lead management, or if it is, you know, creating the financial package, creating the budget packages um, that the operations team has to do. If you're focused on just all the multi-channel marketing coming in and looking at your marketing data to understand your resources and how, you know, what channel of marketing is working best and just really creating those efficiencies for the onsite team. I'd have to say that our technology group and then all that surrounds that, right? So it is a little bit of marketing. It's a little bit of IT. It's a little bit of sometimes risk and so forth, but Everything focuses, everything that touches, you know, prospects, it touches residents, it touches team members, it touches the accounting department, it touches clients. All of that technology really does touch all of the audiences that we interface with. So I would say that the depth and the resources and support that we offer on the technology side is probably second to none. We have experts in all of those different channels that all provide input to really create that efficiency and that effectiveness that allows our operations teams to hopefully maneuver in the best fashion that they can in attracting prospects, in creating efficiencies for, you know, and a really good customer experience for both prospects and residents, right? And then all the data that's used internally from an operational perspective. Yeah, it's interesting. So, um, Again, Gray Star is a little bit like E.F. Hutton. Boy, am I dating myself by using that reference? I don't know if you <laughs> know what that means, but but you know when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. It used to be the saying when I was growing up. Um, and I feel like when Gray Star uh, goes through that process of selecting vendors and technology and equipment, that sort of thing, uh, some of that ends up becoming the standard in the industry as a result. Would you mind just expanding a little bit and sharing with with um, the listeners, the students here at the academy today, um, what what are some of the specific kinds of technologies that Graystar has deployed as part of your technology platform? Yeah, that's a great question, and you know, every day it changes, and there's more things that are added, <laughs> uh, right? And so, I mean, it's you know, some of the basics, right? Because you have your standard property management system. So, you know, I kind of consider that that's you know, that's kind of the vehicle, right? And that's that's the baseline. And then from there, I would say, obviously, revenue management um, has been a key component to really drive 
um, you know, the rents and the revenue that we would like. Um, You have items such as, um, oh my gosh, you know, uh, you're talking, you know, SEO and SEM that, you know, different channels we're looking at. You're looking at, um, you know, Things such as to, you know, I don't want to really go down product specificity, but thing that allows you to do self-guided tours and virtual tours, especially in the environment of COVID has been absolutely instrumental. And then you have things such as, you know, even your product, right? With, you know, Leonardo 24 seven, where we're using that to really help guide the teams and help them stay on task because there's so many things that we have to utilize. Um, you know, we have lighting audits, we have annual inspection reports, we have daily tasks that really it's, it helps to create those, I would say consistency so that we don't miss things. Um, but when we're talking about integration, we're also talking about smart home technology. So we're always testing a variety of that to determine, okay, what is the best way from, you know, being able to access a, you know, a property to accessing the building to accessing the units. So there's all these things that bolt on to the property management system, and it just keeps evolving. Sometimes it's a little overwhelming, um, but also your lead management tools, right? And now starting to move into, um, you know, artificial intelligence and how does that get layered on? So is the prospect talking, you know, at some point in time, that first interaction may be artificial intelligence with the chatbot, and then it converts into a live person. So these technologies, um, I would say, are layered and they're getting more complex as we continue to evolve as an industry. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, the pandemic has really accelerated in some cases, if not the development, certainly the the acceptance of some of these technologies. You, you mentioned virtual touring and the bots and that sort of thing. Let me ask you, what, what do you think, um, what have we learned during this process, just specifically around um, the intersection of technology and touring and marketing. Okay. What have we learned that we had to sort of resort to in during the pandemic that you think will stick with us as a, as, as an ongoing, like new way of doing things? That's a, that's a great question. And I think there's probably a number of things I think originally, or I should say initially when COVID hit, you know, we had shelter in place and, you know, the multifamily industry was known as a, we were an essential service. People had to have a place to live. So we had to have our doors open, so to speak, maybe not, you know, physically open, but we needed to be able to still service our residents. But that also means, you know, people moving out and then people moving in. And so in order to get people to move in, we had to still be able to facilitate tours. But then you also had the, you know, the aspect of, how do we do that in a fashion that the onsite team feels comfortable in and, you know, reduce risk, but also the prospect? So I would say that our industry in general has probably been slow to adopt technologies where other industries maybe have, you know, advanced sooner. And, you know, the single family home industry is a great example, right? They've been using lockboxes and, and, you know, self-touring for quite a while. And so when it, when COVID hit, we really had to move to those self-guided tours and doing tours with prospects if they weren't coming in to be able to do it, you know, FaceTime and Zoom and, and things that we have not, I mean, we really got creative. I don't think that's going to go away. I think we have a certain subset of prospects that want to do things on their own time and by themselves because they feel comfortable and they like that autonomy and that ability to do things that the way that if they want to spend more time in a room or not, they, they want to do that, right. It's going to be on their terms. And I think you also have some individuals that, you know, as we continue through this, you know, on the, on the pandemic that you have a a group of people too, that they, they want the interaction, but they want it virtually. They don't want to be in your face. They want you to help them. And so they need that extra attention or that extra explanation where those tours, you know, still via FaceTime or Zoom or whatever they are, is still going to happen. So I think that COVID in some fashions forced us to have these disruptions. And I think it will continue to evolve us in a fashion a lot faster 
where we may not have had adoption on both sides, both meaning prospects and our operations team for, you know, three to five years. And we had to do it in, you know, three weeks to five weeks. So I think that will stick for sure. Yeah. I've, I've heard similarly from other operators and, uh, you know, I'm sure when you were a, a baby leasing agent, um, you know, you probably heard us say, or somebody probably said to you, you're not selling the property, you're selling yourself. Like, you know, people want to be comfortable with the leasing team first. And, and we have, I think, proved that maybe not always true. Um, that there is certainly a class of asset that can sell itself. Um, and, and certainly a class of, of prospect that can sell themselves. Yeah. So, um, I, I, it'll be interesting to see how that translates into how we might staff properties differently in the future as a result. Yeah, I think, you know, you may see some trends, you know, um, as we move down the road, but I, you know, I think one of the things that we've continued to see is that people still need a level of interaction at some point in time. It's either to get questions answered or to, you know, to do a follow-up because they may not know their next step, if that makes sense. So Michelle, what is, what's, uh, you, you alluded to it earlier. You talked about the rise of AI. Um, what, what is, what's Graystar looking at now? Like what are some trends you think that, that we're likely to see become more commonplace in the market? Yeah, I definitely say chatbots and the ability to interface with prospects. I think you're also going to see artificial intelligence with service request and residents kind of interfacing with those types of um, technologies as well when they're either have a question or potentially with, you know, service request and so forth. And then I think you'll also start to see them utilized on the financial side where they are, where the, the different bots are looking at financials and identifying potentially um, you know, either miscoded items and things like that, that would actually increase the efficiency of the accounting group. So I think you're going to see a pretty significant shift over the next several years in using bots in a, in a number of fashions that I think are going to create some efficiencies in, in, in our industry. Yeah. Interesting. The work order thing is interesting. I mean, I guess if we can, if we can handle, uh, tour requests with a bot. I mean, we can certainly answer what's the status of my of my work order with the bot. That's fascinating. Or I have a, I have a toilet that's plugged up, right? And the bot finds out is it the master? You know, because it can tell that it's in a two bedroom. The person's in a two bedroom, right? I think there's a lot of interesting things that are going to start to uh, to transpire over the next, you know, probably you know one and a half to three years. Neat. I like it. Well, let's now now we can switch to. We can switch to the people side for a little bit. Uh, I mean, you said it. This is a people centric business for sure. I mean, for, for every dollar that's generated in management fee revenue, um, you have a massive number of people deployed at a given, at a given property in comparison to, to other industries. And, um, you talked earlier about how, the challenge of making sure everybody's doing things the right way in the right time and that sort of thing. Um, so that alone is, is, is a big effort. I'm sure. Training is a big part of that as well. But, um, one of the, the other half of the people equation here is that we're, our, our product is some, in many ways an experience for people. And when you have 300, 500, a thousand people living in a community, like you're going to have a, a cross section of people that's going to include some difficult people, um, some mentally ill people, some people that can maybe even be violent. I mean, it, it is a, it is a, it takes a toll having for community managers to be on the, the front lines of that and having to sort of doesn't happen all the time, but it happens enough that it can be, it's one of the things that makes this, this industry difficult. How does, how does Grace Star create a culture? that keeps people engaged and optimistic and interested in light of what can be difficult work environments from time to time? That's a really good question. And I think I'm going to answer it in a couple different fashions. And, you know, I think it, it starts with hiring the right person. And when I say the right person is, it's not, this is definitely not made for everybody, right? Um, because it is, right. we're, we're solving problems. Underscore that. Yeah, we're solving problems on a daily basis. And I think that when, you know, when we're going out and we're recruiting, you know, team members, 
you know, we are looking at personalities of a property because every property has its own personality, just like you're saying, right? We have a product that is urban and we have a product that's suburban and we have, you know, B product that is urban and B product that's suburban and we have everything in between. And as I said before, student and active adult and so forth. So when we're looking at hiring team members, I think the first thing is, is we're really looking for people that have a servant's heart that want to help, right? Because we're helping people, you know, find a place to live. We're helping people, you know, with a lot of times they have problems, meaning they, you know, they've, they've gone through a divorce, they've got married, or they have some type of unique situation because we get to live, we get to work where people live. And so that's a very personal situation So I think having people that really can be, you know, empathetic and have a servant's heart and want to really create a good level of customer service is, is really, really critical. And obviously some of the positions that we have in the organization have less people contact, but we're going to focus on, you know, really the onsite team. And those individuals are, you know, they're, they're working with our prospects, they're working with our residents, they're working with our service providers that are coming to the property. So they really do need to be people oriented. So I think hiring the best person um, is, is extremely important in developing that culture. I think also is that, you know, when we have to be able to knowledge share and support them on the evolution of not only the products that we're asking them to operate in, right? So there's training opportunities with systems, but there's also training opportunities on soft skills. And you can teach people how to run a system, but it's not necessarily, you can, it's very difficult to teach somebody how to be nice, right? And maybe here's some tips on how to be patient. So intrinsically, they do need to be, like I said, kind-hearted individuals. But we do offer classes that are soft skill oriented to help them learn how to problem solve and have patience and learn really how to uncover what the real situation is. So I think those soft skill classes are, are really important. And then also leadership development. Um, and as somebody moves up through you know, their career path, they have opportunities to advance with soft skills, but they also have those, you know, kind of what we call A to Z, which is the systems because the systems do change. But then we also have a factor of we're a large organization, but we try to really operate locally. So we try to stay flat as possible so that individuals have access to their leadership team, which can be their regional manager and their director, but also the managing director of that region or city so that there's interaction with them and they really are part of a team locally so that they don't feel like they're disconnected or lost in a really big organization. But we really do focus on, lo on operating locally. And then we have a variety of channels because we know that this is a, you know, it's an environment of social media like events. So how do we communicate other than email, right? And conference calls. We have a, we have a, a tool that we use internally called Yammer. And Yammer is a way for us to have people be able to talk about successes and share photos and really feel connected universally within our organization and start to develop relationships outside of their local market with support departments and other operations across the country so that we're sharing best practices and they're getting high fives and kudos and that affirmation and confirmation from folks around the country that they may not even know, but start to develop a relationship. And so I think all of that packages it into really creating that culture that we want people to feel connected and that they feel supported, not just at their property, but as an entire organization, but without overwhelming them with the size of Graystar. This is interesting, Michelle. I think that um, it's unexpected to hear you as you talk about training to hear such a focus on the soft skills. I think we think of training, we think of fair housing training and, and maintenance training. Of all the training that Graystar does, how much would you say on a percent basis is, is really more on these soft skills? I would probably say at least 60 to 70% is really focused on soft skills. Wow. 
Huh. And and um, internally developed programs. These this this training on soft skills. That's a that's a great question. So it's a combination. Some of them are internally. Some of them we've gone externally. Um, and you know we've gone to various organizations such as you know Ritz Carlton and also Myers Briggs and a variety um, Dale Carnegie of just a whole variety where we've pulled in a number of resources and then also consulting organizations. So, you know, how do we continue to support an evolving work, you know, workforce that has, I mean, you know, we have such diversity within our workforce with over 19,000 team members, you know, we have to be able to pull in all of these different items to be able to support the teams that we have. Yeah. And I think we should just point out that these soft skills um, apply to the service team too. They, they are in touch with residents. They had, there's a resident experience they're having as well. And so, yeah, across the board, these things are important. 70%. That's amazing. Um, and I, I think again, just illustrative of, of the amazing resources that are brought to bear within the Grace organization to do that kind of training that it's just hard to duplicate elsewhere. And I think it's one of the things that from, from my opinion really make you great. Um, uh, what, what, um, shifting gears a little bit to just the operation side. So we talked about platforms that you guys are using. We've talked about the importance of training, that sort of thing. Um, but generally speaking is what do you think one of the largest challenges is in providing great management oversight of, of multifamily properties? So I'm going to probably tackle that in three different fashions. I think it depends on who you ask. Okay. Cause you have, we have different audiences. So you could ask our owners and they're going to say, this is the big challenge. You're going to ask our operations team and they're going to say, this is the big challenge. And then you're going to ask residents and they're going to say, this is the challenge, right? Oh, okay. So I'm going to break it down in, in all three segments. So I would say if you're, if you're talking about owners in today's environment, I think their biggest challenge is managing the delinquency and feeling like their opportunities, meaning their hands are tied with some of the things that they can do to control those delinquencies by not being able to evict residents for non-payment. And so I would say, um, you know, our, our clients today feel in some instances, especially depending on what area of the country they're in, like they're, I mean, they get it, right? They, they want to be empathetic and they want to be sensitive, but at the same time, they own a business. They still have to pay their taxes. They still have to make their debt service. You know, they still have to operate the property. And so I would say that that is a big challenge is how do we continue to assist and, and give the clients um, as much attention as we can with managing the delinquencies, but still understand that we have to navigate within the parameters of the of the local moratoriums and legislation that's been passed at a given time, Right. And that's, that's a delicate balancing act. So I would say owners are very focused on compression of revenue, expenses, you know, where we are today. If you're looking at our ops team, I would say they are constantly, their biggest challenge is the time they have to complete all the, all the stuff that is, that is needed in a given day. And that is a constant balance for them is how do I prioritize everything that needs to be done, whether it is the tours or the financial reports or, you know, filling out applications for, um, you know, federal relief of rent, you know, for rent relief um, and the delinquency reports that the, you know, the clients want. So I would say our, our operations team, the time and the, and the demand is, is a constant struggle for them. And then I think our residents are, again, kind of going back to the diversity, right, is we have you know, such a diversity of, of residents that live in our communities across the United States is how do we really appeal to their needs as individuals? Because we really do have a society today that's like, it's about me, right? And what I want and what I want in my apartment and what, what you're selling me you've got to be very careful is because it's about me and my needs and my wants and not just this blanket, you know, you have a two bedroom, right? And, and it should fit. So I would say that our residents are, you know, their biggest challenges is how do I, how do I find a place that really does 
appeal to my needs and what I want. And they're giving me the service at the level I need. So it's, I think that there's a lot of dynamics in our industry today that has definitely changed, you know, over the last five years, but definitely, I mean, when you look back at when I started in the industry, it is, I mean, it, it's an apartment, but it has changed drastically with regards to all the stuff that, that we have to think about today. Well, the moratoriums, that sort of thing, and, and even some of the restrictions that come with the CARES Act funds, I mean, that you that you guys have been saddled with is brand new. Like nobody's really, people are still figuring out how to make their way through that. So hopefully that will be thing of the past come this time next year, or at least mostly in our, in the rear view mirror. But I want to ask you what about what you're saying about residents. That's interesting. Um, to make it feel like them, is that an, is that an amenity question, Michelle? And if so, are your developer, are your, are your clients, your developers changing the, the makeup of properties, um, of, of, of communities to fit that? Or is it something else? Is it uh, some esoteric way you make people feel like home that's not related to the theater, right? That's in, that nobody ever goes into and uses. Yeah, you know, I think that's that's a great question, and I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that in a couple of different fashions too. So I think one is it is the service level, right? Really understanding what the resident wants and what their needs are, and trying to understand who they are as an individual. And I think a great a great way to explain that is also the use of self-guided tours and, and the virtual tours where we're doing FaceTime and so forth. It's really trying to deliver the service at the level that they want and they need. So it's having that, that personal approach to, you know, hey, Mr. or Miss or Mrs., um, you know, prospect, what are you, how do you, you know, how do you want to interface, right? And it's, I think that's, it starts with the level of service. I would say that it is also how we build communities and and it could be the it could be the amenities that are being offered it could be some of maybe the flexibility of the properties um and how we're using space and we do track I would say how residents um choose apartments right how do you choose to live in you know property A or property B what it, what made you decide that and then I would say it's also what type of value they put on a specific item. And so we do ask renters, what is your preference? What are the things that are important to you? And it's, and it's amazing. One of the, the number one factor that we have found out over the past, and I think it's been consistent now for over the last three years when we've been um, surveying residents is soundproofing. Oh. And soundproofing has always been at the top of the list. But since we, you know, when we initiated the the survey during COVID, it went from like, you know, say about 75% of the residents saying soundproofing was important to like 95% of the, you know, residents saying soundproofing was important. So we do track that. Does it make a material change in how we develop? Not yet, but it is something that we, we keep in mind and we have a finger on the pulse and we're trying to figure out what does that exactly mean? And so I think we'll see, we'll continue to see that evolve. And then we share that information with, you know, our third party clients who also develop and do renovations so that they can use that and make determinations on how they want to tackle, you know, their programming of their properties and, and things that they may want to consider as well. Wow. That's fascinating. I mean, I, I hope everybody's getting, getting as interested as I am in all of these sort of things. I mean, if we could talk for a long time just about how you maximize a resident's um, experience, like across all those different um, ways, those levers that you have to to make people feel at home, both through service and the actual physical plant. Um, but I, I, we're running short on time, but I do want to ask you one more question that I love to ask um, uh, experienced operators in the business, which is, if there is one thing that you believe to be true about this business that you think most everybody else might disagree with, what do you think that is? Oh my gosh. Um, I would say, you know, because I'm always thinking about, right. How do we balance owners expectations and our operations expectations? And, you know, we really, you know, we're always trying to maximize, you know, property performance. And I always think about, you know, clients are like revenue, revenue, revenue is that, you know, when we have a property that has a performance challenge and we've all had it, I mean, you know, it, it, any company at any given time can have a challenge at a property. And I would say, you know, 
one of the first things is not to run to drop rents. Um, you know, we found a lot of times that dropping rents, while it may have a short term impact, it's not always the permanent impact. And so um, we probably have some operations teams that are like, oh, my gosh, don't say that because, you know, we, that we're priced too high. Sometimes it is price, right? But don't, that shouldn't always be the first thing that we should go and focus on is dropping rents. You know, really take a step back and look at, you know, all the the four P's or the five P's, depending on yes. which era you grew up in, right? <laughs> yeah, right? But it can be an aspect that dropping rent is not always the, the magic bullet. Um, sometimes it's interesting. You may actually increase rents to give a perception um, for another floor plan. So there's there's creative things that I think sometimes you have to take a step back and just while we always want to run to to drop rents, that's not always the right answer. Ah, I can hear I can hear owners across the country applauding. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. 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 Um, well, Michelle, this has been really enlightening. Um, I, again, we could talk for hours about this stuff. I really thank you for coming on and sharing some of your insights. Um, if, um, look, normally I say if people are interested in your, I mean, I don't, I don't think anybody doubts how they can get a hold of Graystar, but, but if somebody was interested in coming to work for Graystar or, or you, you have an apartment and you, you'd like to have somebody like you talk to them about managing it, where, where would people go? They can actually reach out to me directly. They can go to graystar.com, but you can reach out to me. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on our Graystar website. Um, you can find me. My phone number, I think, is on both places as well. Give me a call. Shoot me an email. And we're more than happy to help you out for sure. Great. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's good seeing you. I appreciate your time. Well, thank you for logging in and listening today here at the Academy. If you've enjoyed these podcasts and you feel like your management company could use a little advice from some of the professors here at the Apartment Academy, then go to our website, apartmentacademy.com, and click Help Me. We'll send you a questionnaire and provide individualized responses to your answers at no charge that I guarantee will offer you insights on ways you can immediately improve apartment operations. Well, I hope you took good notes today. Your only test, though, awaits you every day in the leasing office. Until next time, class is dismissed. <laughs>